Hello. I'm here today to briefly talk about postmodernism. And please bear in mind that it's a kind of a hard topic for me. And I'll try to do justice to it, but I don't in any way claim uh, an absolute all exhaustive knowledge about postmodernism. And part of the reason is because some of my students are studying postmodernism, and also a few of you had requested that I should record a lecture on postmodernism. So here I am. Uh, I will be mostly in the later part of this lecture focusing on one particular book by Linda Hutchin, A Poetics of Postmodernism, and share her insights about it. But now, by way of introduction, one thing to keep in mind is how postmodernism is imagined, especially by those who oppose it. So you might have watched some videos on YouTube or listened to some lectures. And one peculiar thing that comes out of it is that all these people who have opposing views to postmodernism usually create a straw man argument. So they make postmodernism into this something stable and threatening and then challenge its assumptions and attack it from their own view of what they think is uh, literature ought to be or the world ought to be. That that's why it's not surprising that when I started doing my research on postmodernism for my master's degree, I realized that a lot of the early critiques of postmodernism were coming from uh, the church groups, from religious scholars. And obviously, they had their reasons. And one of the main reasons was that they assumed that postmodernism is some form of an absolute relativism and that it doesn't allow for any kind of grand religious narratives. And they found that to be really threatening. And they saw the world as this postmodernist world, right? So speaking in terms of literary studies, the first question that comes to mind is whether or not, you know, the post in postmodernism actually implies that modernism is over and postmodernism has started. This is a question that I face uh, when I try to explain postcolonial studies to people as well, because they always read the post as a, a marker, as a temporal marker, assuming that if I call myself a post-colonialist, I might think that colonialism is actually over. Uh, and we always try to convince people that, no, we don't believe in that. Similarly, for postmodernism, it is important to keep in mind that it doesn't imply that modernism is over. Actually, postmodernism plays with all the major tropes of modernism, it would not be possible to be a postmodernist without knowing modernism. And also, postmodernism, unlike modernism, which offered you know, a stable episteme of its own, postmodernism doesn't necessarily offer a very stable episteme as declaring, I am postmodernist. And by and large, I mean, there's a, another scholar, Brian McHale. He has a beautiful book on postmodernist fiction. And in the introduction, he talks about how modernism and postmodernism have two different philosophical paradigms, right? And in case of modernism, in his view, modernism is what he calls the epistemological dominant, whereas postmodernism is ontological dominant. What he means by that is that in postmodernism, in modernism, if you pick up a modernist novel, right, uh, you know, any of Faulkner's novel, but Epsilon, Epsilon, right, there is always the question that we ask ourselves while reading a postmodernist novel is, who is telling the story? Can I trust the narrator? Uh, the question is always about knowing there is a secret, you know, in the beginning of Epsilon, Epsilon, Miss Rosa has called Quentin because she has something to share with him. So in Brian McH uh, McHale's view, most modernist novels are a kind of related to a detective story. There is a secret 
that the narrator wants to share with us. We have to read the whole novel to find out, but then that is undermined because we are also trying to struggle whether or not we can trust the narrator or not, right? So the question is of knowing the truth or how it is represented. But Brian McHale suggests that in postmodernism, the question is usually of being, right? Ontological, is this the only life? Is this the only universe? Is this the only way of being? So those are some of the questions that we ask ourselves as we read a postmodernist novel, hence his suggestion that postmodernist novels are ontological dominant. And in his view, then the sister genre of postmodernism is science fiction, because it is in science fiction that we think of multiple realities, parallel timelines, you know, multiple universes, multiple existences. So that's his view on modernism and postmodernism. And I somehow like that because it's a very easy way to distinguish between the two, uh, between modernism and postmodernism. Hutchian's book, in my view, A Poetics of Postmodernism, is probably one of the most magisterial works on postmodernism. It was the first major work of its kind. There were other people writing about postmodernism. People like Ahab Hassan and others had started writing about postmodernism, you know, a long time ago in the 70s and 80s. But I think what Hutchian does is she not only develops new vocabularies for us to understand postmodernism, but she also gives us a wonderful critique of critiques of postmodernism, but without pinpointing postmodernism as this stable system of writing and art production, she gives us a clear understanding that, you know, it has certain tropes that we can look for but it often destabilizes those itself within even a given work. Um, and in the introduction to her work, she basically suggests that she's going to take most of her cues from architecture because it is in architecture actually that postmodernism is first introduced in the late 70s and early 80s. And that was, in a way, a response to the modernist architecture, its brutalist styles, its attempt at creating spaces to discipline human bodies, right? And Charles Jenks is one of the leading names in that. He's the architect who, you know, first being a modernist architecture, then when he becomes a postmodernist, he increasingly starts creating spaces that don't worry about whether this is contemporary or not, that, 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 that actually care about how a space enters the public sphere, his designs, how to integrate the public sphere in, a, in an uh, architectural model, but also more importantly, who uh, advocates for a kind of architecture which is, doesn't necessarily say, I am Baroque and I am this, where you can have a modern Walmart with 19th century arches, right? Or where that kind of hybridity is acceptable. So, and there is a certain degree of parody, you know, classic or neoclassic designs in modern buildings, which are aware that these things are incongruent, but they make them work, you know, in a modern building. And it's that parodic element that Hutchin says is also crucial to understanding postmodernism. Hutchin also suggests that postmodernism, by its very nature as a craft, uh, is contradictory, historical, and political. Contradictory in so many ways. Okay, so it contradicts its own assumptions, right? It contradicts certain major tropes of post of modernism itself. I mean, for example, the distinction between high and low. Okay, so uh, in modernist art, there was one uh, thing that was kind of assumed by writers and poets, and that was that they were offering their work as a finished and deeply crafted work of art. And the assumption behind that was that not everyone can just slog through it 
right? They never wrote their novels for novels that are sold at airports. You couldn't just sit during a flight and breeze through a modernist novel. A modernist poem or a modernist novel offered itself as a complex work of art, probably a whole, but also it required of its reader a certain degree of literary training, a certain level of education just to get through it. I mean, think of some of the major modernist works that you have read or are aware of. The Wasteland by T.S. Eliot, a poem. I mean, it's a poem that you can't just pick up and read and say, this is a great poem. Maybe you'll enjoy it, but to really understand it, you have to get the illusions. You have to, you know, go find you know, a reference book that explains the illusion. It's the first poem probably, which has internal footnotes. Uh, similarly, if you pick up Joyce's novels, right? Um, any of Faulkner novels, Epsilon, Epsilon, for example, right? None of these novels are novels that you can just sit and read and just breeze through. They require you to work through that. Now, the postmodern novel plays with that earnestness, right? But then it doesn't take itself seriously. It makes you laugh at its own self. Think, on, think of uh, Midnight's Children. I mean, um, it has all of these things. It offers itself as a novel, but then makes fun of its own self, the storytelling in itself. It's historical, right? But the return to the history, which um, Hutchin calls the presence of the past, that in postmodernist fiction, past is always present, right? But it's not a nostalgic return to the past. It doesn't tell us the story of, oh, this is what happened in the past. Here was a prince. No, no. It takes anything from the past, a character, an event, right? And then parodizes it. I mean, makes a parody out of it or reworks it through imagination to represent it differently or to represent it in a facetious or parodic way. Uh, and the great example of that also is Midnight's Children. I mean, essentially, Midnight's Children is the novel of creation of India and Pakistan, right? Birth of India, so since it's focused mostly on India, which is a historical event. But when you start reading it, it's not a general historical account of history itself. The idea of history itself is complicated. We are privy to that history through the imagination of our protagonist, Salim, Salim Sinai, right? And here is a character who says that it is he himself who, who's driving that history. And then the history itself is told from the point of view of those who um, might have existed on its margins. It's playful, right? It's not deeply earnest about the sanctity of history itself. And so that is presence of the past in postmodernist novels, but that past is worked upon. And most of the times it's worked upon to get some tragic comic effects. Then Hutchian theorizes a term which she calls historiographic metafiction, okay, which is intensely self reflexes reflexive but historical. What does she mean by historiographic metafiction? Because that's crucial for understanding postmodernism, right? And I'm going to read it, what she says. She says, by historiographic metafiction, I mean those well-known and popular novels which are both intensely self-reflexive and yet paradoxically also lay claim to historical events and personages. Okay, the French lieutenant's woman, Midnight's children, legs, famous last words. So what we understand by historiographic metafiction then is that these are novels, but also writings that use history, right? And they are self-reflexive. They point to their own creation. I am a story. I am a novel about birth of India, right? And they would have the real life historical figures in the novels, right? 
but they are not necessarily offered as the traditionally known historical figures. Right? Sometimes they are altered. Sometimes they are made to say things that they would have not said historically. So what historiographic metafiction is that it's incorporated within the narrative, but then it is reworked in a way that we see the same history imaginatively from the point of view of the characters within a novel. So the same event that we have read in history books could be rendered completely differently because we are reading it, you know, as a historical event, but as a fictionalized historical event as told by a character in a story. There are quite a few other examples as well that you can read, but some of the novels she already mentions. Now, if you've read The French Lieutenant's Woman or watched a movie, there are two plots going on there, right? There is a historical account of this lieutenant and a woman he has an affair with, right? And while the movie is being filmed on that novel, the two lead characters are also having an affair. And towards the end, the novelist decides which narrative, the historical that is being filmed, will end in their union or whether the two actors, the male and female characters playing the filming of that historical novel, uh, which one of them will end up being together, right? So historiographic metafiction then is fiction that uses history, but makes us see it differently because it's history that has been worked on, right? Then another important aspect of postmodernism that Hutchin talks about is that it has fluid generic boundaries. Now, what does she mean by that? First of all, I mean uh, that there is no distinction between this is a science fiction novel and this is an art novel, this is a literary novel, and this is you know a utopian novel or historical hist historical novel the genres or the storytelling is not restricted to one or the other. At one point, each novel can incorporate real history and then personal histories. It can become a tragedy. It can become a comedy. I mean, think of it, the limit postmodernist novels, if you look at it, um, uh, if you really want to read Slaughterhouse-Five, right? I mean, if uh, technically it's a historical novel, right? It's the bombing of Dresden, right? But if you open the novel and start reading it, it the novel is also self-reflexive. It's talking about its own creation because the narrator tells us, the, I think the opening line is, I've always wanted to write a novel about Dresden, right? And then as he's explaining this process where he's been thinking about the novel, which would have otherwise been a preface, we realize we are in the novel, we are in the story. Right, um, so it's no longer just a just a preface. It is actually part of the novel. Um, so the generic boundaries, the f even like temporal genres, like a, a postmodern novel could offer itself as a postmodern novel, but could use the techniques of the nineteenth-century novel. Right, like the, sometimes the narrator would address you and say, "Here." You know, like they used in 19th century novels, you would say, dear reader, I will now take you here where so and so are getting married. Now, strictly speaking, that should not be repeated in a modernist novel. But in the postmodernist novel, since the novel is also supposed to be self-reflexive, sometimes it will address the reader. And a great example of that is um, Italo Calvino's If on a Winter's Night, A Traveler. Right, the novel starts with you have just bought Italo Calvino's new novel, If on a Winter's Night of Travel. Now pull up a chair, put your put your feet up, tell your roommate to lower the music. Tell him you just got Italo Calvino's new novel, If on a Winter's Night of Travel. Now that's the novel addressing you, the reader, telling you about itself the novel that you have just bought. And then he does so many other brilliant things in the novel, but that's when the novel becomes from a realistic address to the 
reader to a fictional work. I, and it's using second person, but it's also mixing those generic boundaries. Other examples of fluid generic boundaries would be some of the recent novels. I mean, if you look at Mohsin Hamid's uh, How to Get Filthy Rich in Rising Asia, right? It's written like uh, what I think it's written like a diary, right? So it's a, uh, it's a memoir, it's a diary offered to us as a, as a as a story similarly if you have read adiga's the white tiger right that is an epistolary novel that's our main character is writing letters to the chinese premier telling him his own story so two different genres are being merged there right so these are some of the things that but they're being done playfully right and that is the crucial thing. They are not earnest, right? They are being done prayfully. There is satire. There is parody. Then another thing that Hutchian and others mentioned too is this distinction between high and low culture. Okay, so in modernism, we already understood that there is high art and there is popular art or low art, and obviously the high art is considered real art, and the popular art doesn't have much of a say in it. In postmodernism, that distinction is almost abolished, right? And, and even in writings, you know, the writers would incorporate elements of popular art and represent them as an art in the art world itself. What was otherwise considered something not artistic enough becomes artistic, is considered artistic. So it's that distinction between high and low culture that is sort of abolished or undermined. And that is what really troubles a lot of people who have this deep regard for high art, right? Because what they think or what they imagine is that what is offered in the popular culture, you know, traditionally in modernism, uh, what were we mostly worried about, right? Commodification, right? We were worried about uh, this extreme commercialization of education, of literature, pandering that was involved in it, the work of, of art could exist away from it and offer itself as this ideal, right? Now, if you suddenly start assuming that anything that is produced in the public sphere, it can be declared art, it can be declared good writing, right? That flash fiction can be respectable, that fiction written by fans can be respectable, that poems published on the internet can be respectable, right? Oh, when, when you abolish that distance, what you're actually striking at is the established order of things, like right? the established order of who gets to decide what is good art, what is good writing, right? And that distinction is kind of important in postmodernism. I'm not saying that that distinction is abolished, but that there is a lot of play involved and it destabilizes this claim to modernist literature as being something special in opposition to the commodified art and things presented in the public sphere or in the market sphere, right? And that is one of the biggest um, threats that a lot of modernists see in this abolition of this distinction between the popular and, and the artistic and the high art. Another important uh, aspect of postmodernism that Linda Hutchin explains is, is the role of parody. Now remember, uh, most modernist theorists would tell you that irony was one of the major aspects of modernist fiction. In postmodernist fiction, parody becomes very dominant. It's not just parody uh, of persons, right? It can be parody of historical events, rewritings of historical events, and a parody in one way or the other usually always involves satire and humor. So the things that we hold dear, that we hold sacred, you know, become fair play in parody, right? I mean, think of it this way, the entire response to the satanic verses was based in this idea that here was an author who actually had the temerity to parody 
what was considered the sacred historical elements of Islam, right? So by its very nature, then parody is very transgressive. And that is where this claim by postmodernists, I find it really valid, is that one of the challenges posed to postmodernism is that it's apolitical. But when you read these retellings of historical accounts with a certain degree of playfulness, they are subversive, right? They don't only just take away the serious, you know, earnestness of historical records, but they also allow us to think differently about these historical events and historical instances, to think differently about them, to laugh at them, right? And hence put them under pressure. So parody is another big um, trope or aspect of postmodernism. Uh, postmodernist pastiche, right? Which is a lot of people use this term. Simply speaking, pastiche is like when you constantly keep reworking the same idea, right? Uh, in commodity production, pastiche is when you take a work of art and produce like commodifiable things of it. You know, here is a statue of Buddha and you produce a thousand of them and you sell them. Similarly, pastiche is reworking of previously worked ideas. You can sometimes pick up a novel, right? And then write a novel based on that novel, right? And rework it into a different kind of narrative. I mean, what are some of the great examples of it? Uh, of pastiche, uh, if you look at postmodernist fiction, uh, sometimes people would pick up uh, certain cultural claims offered by men and then rework them and tell them from the point of view of women. But generally speaking, pastiche, uh, where pastiche tends to be, in the modernist sense, unoriginal, right? Because you're working with materials already produced, we are retweaking them, where you're rewriting the story, you sometimes will keep the same characters. Because for pastiche artistic literary to be successful, certain elements of the original must be kept at play. Only then you can tell how the author is reworking it. So postmodernist pastiche is um, sort of seen as a commodification of art, but it's ironic, parodic, self-reflexive, and playful. And that means that it is not a disingenuous remaking of something. It's actually, if rightly done, tends out tends to be brilliant. Another important trope of postmodernism is, of course, intertextuality. You know, Hutchins and other take that from uh, Kristeva. The idea that all knowledge is intertextual. Right? This, they, that no one can make a claim, this is my original work, because every work contains traces of other works that came before it, other things imagined by others. So our understanding and representation and writing is always intertextual. After all, even if I'm writing about love, I didn't come up with the idea. Which takes us also into the postmodernist understanding of history itself, that, that, that there is no natural history out there somewhere from where we pull different strands of history. That history by and large, and this is what the post-structuralist taught us too, is textual, right? The way we know history is through text, through monuments, as Foucault would say it, or through text, right? Now, if you believe in that assumption, which is not necessarily an assumption, it's a fact. History is textual. We know history because we read it, we watch it right, on TV, or we look up on the internet, on Wikipedia, but it's always textual. And so then intertextuality becomes a huge part of postmodernism. There, You will find novels that refer to other novels. I mean, Midnight's Children, in the very beginning, Rushdie talks about Shehrzad, right? We cannot understand that reference without knowing the Shehrzad of A Thousand and One Nights, right? Uh, intertextuality in sense of retelling the story of birth of India and Pakistan and Midnight's Children, but that's intertextual because he's picking historical accounts of the events, right? History as textual 
should also teach us another thing. And that is that if history is textual, that means it's motivated at both ends, right? Someone recorded it, right? It didn't just come to be. So if someone recorded it, their politics, their preferences, their prejudices are a part of that act of recording. Then someone goes and retrieves it. So those of us who go and retrieve and read it, we have our own assumptions about it. We take our own preferences and prejudices to it so that the act of recording history and retrieving it and using it is highly motivated. And that tells us that not only that history is not natural, but it's also laced with the personal, social, cultural, and political preferences and prejudices of those who record it and those who retrieve it. And hence, you know, retelling of histories. So for example, there's a beautiful novel by Krista Wolf at Cassandra. It's intertextual because it's using the history of fall of Troy, right, and employing it in, in its storytelling. But it's a different kind of historia, historical novel because it imagines the fall of Troy not from the point of view of the male participants in the battle, but from the point of view of Cassandra, right, one of the daughters of Prime who had the power to prophecy, right? But her curse was that she could prophesy, but no one would believe her. So we are there in the beginning of the novel where uh, Christoph Wolf starts with, this is where she stood, right? So we are in the narrator's mind. And we are right in front of the ruins of Mycenae, right? And, that, and then we are into the consciousness of Cassandra, right? So that history is totally imagined. There is no necessarily and no extant account of the experiences of Cassandra. The author is imagining it, right? But by doing that, she invokes a history as seen by a woman, which could have been recorded, right? If historically men had not decided what is worthy of recording and what is worthy of saving. So that's intertextuality and history as textual, uh, as Linda Hutchin explains it. Then she also goes and talks about, I mean, we are trying to cover a huge book and I'm just summarizing it. Please keep that in mind. And the concept of the eccentric, right? So simply stated, I mean, in modernism and also in uh, most philosophical thought, what we consider the norm or normal philosophy or normal way of thinking, it's, it has a center, right? So the dominant group's ideologies and ideas are represented in history. The dominant aesthetic is what decides what we write about, how we write about. In postmodernism, the emphasis then is shifted to the eccentric, to those who are not part of the dominant group. It's their stories who start complicating the mainstream historiography, the mainstream narrative telling. So sometimes you'll, as I just mentioned, Krista Wolf novels tells the story of the fall of Troy from the eccentric subject, the women. You also then encounter a lot of works of literature that would tell you about the experiences of migrants, experiences of women, transgender people, gay and lesbian people, people who are in a minority position. So increasingly then that space to represent is no longer, it no longer defaults on the dominant group's assumptions, right? Similarly, his history itself becomes eccentric because instead of reading the narratives of history as incorporated in fiction from the dominant point of view, we can either imagine how the conquered communities imagine that history, how can that be incorporated? There, there's a beautiful novel, Flight by Sherman Alexie, right? Where he takes us into 12 historic instances of American history of extreme violence of the white settlers against the native populations. And we experience those moments not from the point of view of the official recorders of that history, but the native people themselves, right? And so that is, you know, 
postmodernism being eccentric. Now, constitutive otherness is a related concept. What it means is that in postmodernism, and this doesn't come from Hutchin, this comes from another book, is that, that what was traditionally considered the other of the center in postmodernism, it's that other that constitutes the center. And understanding that is crucial. Okay. How? So think of a circle. Okay. We always say, you know, the center and the periphery. But if we thought in terms of constitutive otherness, we know that without the periphery, right, the center cannot be constituted. The center doesn't just create the periphery. It absolutely needs the periphery to constitute itself. So if we apply that concept to any large truth claims, truth claims and claims by any dominant group, what we realize is that what they consider the peripheral outside of the center, not necessarily part of the um, center, is absolutely essential in constituting the center itself. Similarly, if we apply it to ourselves, right, ourselves, we think we constitute ourselves, not realizing that it's the world outside, the language, the culture in which we exist, people on the margins from ourselves are the ones who constitute us. And this constitutive otherness is also uh, very dominant in postmodern literature. And now to the biggest thing, you know, which most critics of postmodernism respond to. And that is the death of grand narratives. And, you know, that was one of the conclusions made by Leotard in his report on postmodern knowledge. And so what he suggests there is that the world has reached a point where all the grand narratives upon which different civilizational projects were built have reached a point where they have lost their apodictic claims to being true. Now, I believe that it is, you know, it's very Eurocentric to believe that, but let's try to understand it. So any claims to truth on religious grounds, like or on the account of here is what is our history in postmodernism, all of those claims to truth that lent stability to a system have come to crisis and have been replaced by what he calls, you know, in translation, what could be called by the micro narratives. And most conservative scholars and pundits find that really troubling because what they read into that is that there is no truth, right? And that postmodernists believe in absolute kind of relativism, everything goes, but that's not what Leotard is saying. What he's saying is that those grand narratives were stabilized historically and politically through exclusions, right? So if we believed uh, that men are superior and have had a larger role in human history, that is not natural. That was discursively produced because men had the power to define those narratives. Now, those grand narratives upon which you can build, build a whole system of gender privilege comes to crisis because those who were marginalized suddenly start telling their stories and start saying, no, or we had a lot to do with progress too. We are rational beings too. So that is what I read into it. Because I don't read any grand narratives as natural. So they're crumbling and replacement by, by micro narratives is not because people absolutely don't believe in larger truths. When I die, deep down, we all believe in human decency. We believe that there are certain things that are absolutely wrong at all the time and that we should take care of each other. Human beings should be kind. These are all grand narratives. But what happens to these grand narratives is they become unsustainable because the exclusions upon which they were built uh, suddenly become unstable because people who were excluded to create these grand narratives basically come and complicate the story and start telling their own stories, right? Uh, 
which this is what Foucault called the buried knowledge is, right? When they come out and they challenge the established dominant knowledge, right? Dominant episteme. So that was the death of grand narratives. My critique of it is also that we are also seeing the rise of reconstruction of grand narratives, of chauvinistic nationalism, right? It's happening in the United States, it's happening in India, Pakistan, uh, rise of religious fundamentalism here, you know, also in the Muslim world, in India and elsewhere. So there is a reactionary response from people who believe in certain grand narratives, right? And they want to return. So their return to history is actually a nostalgic return, right? Because they want to go back to history, recreate this narrative, bring it back to the future to challenge what comes across as this, you know, uh, abundance of narratives to choose from. And in postmodernist fiction, I'm not saying it's totally reflectionist, it's of obviously imaginative, but since it's also deeply connected to issues of popular culture, popular politics, so what you get then is not necessarily a coherent narrative, because remember those coherent narratives were built through exclusions, but a kind of heteroglossia in which so many voices can be speaking about the same truth and you have to decide which truth to go by, right? And not necessarily offering one truth that reason alone can save our problems or love alone can save our problems, but something in between, something heterogeneous, right? And that was one of the major claims uh, in Leotard, uh, the death of grand narratives. Now, some concluding thoughts. Like, so overall, what I've tried to explain is after reading Linda Hutchin and all the other scholars, that postmodernism basically is not necessarily post because modernism is over, but it's something that plays with all the major tropes of modernism. It doesn't offer an episteme of itself. It relies heavily on parody, right? Parody of history, parody of historical characters, even parody of forms of literary production themselves, genres and others and that it is highly intertextual. You will find one story in another. Sometimes one character from another book will be a character in another book. Um, it is, um, you know, generically fluid. You know, one, you, you will pick up a novel which is written like a uh, letter, right? Uh, the distinction between the high and low culture is almost erased because anything that is produced, which is a text, can be consumed, can become literature, can become part of our uh, reading, over reading list. Um, it involves pastiche, which is reworking and reworking of previously produced works. And that there is a high emphasis on including the voices that are traditionally excluded. And it may not have, you know, a pronounced politics of the left or the right, but by and large, by placing itself within the world as it exists with its divisions and trying to retrieve voices and rearticulate them, it has a destabilizing effect on any grand narratives, any grand stories that necessarily were built by silencing certain constituencies. So I actually do not agree with the scholars and pundits who believe that postmodernism is a free for all and there is no politics in it. I think destabilizing any dominantly produced narratives which are imposed ideologically and sometimes forcefully in itself is a revolutionary act and hence uh, to me, as a post-colonialist, postmodernism tends to be um, the kind of literature that I find useful and that I think can do a lot for uh, uh, any readers, but especially those who are invested in modernism. So these are some of my thoughts on postmodernism.
I am pretty sure I have not exhausted the topic and maybe have made some mistakes in explaining it. But if you have any questions, please feel free to post them um, under the video or to my website, postcolonial.net. And thank you so, so much for watching this video and for giving me the chance to talk about postmodernism. Thank you.